On this beautiful morning, we're going to have a look at the vertebrae of the horse and the ox. For both the equine and the bovine, we want to know the vertebral formula, review the structures of the vertebrae, and note the differences between the equine and the bovine. Also, we want to make sure we know what passes through each of the vertebral foramina. And then we want to review the sites used for epidural anesthesia. A note about the cervical vertebra. Remember that they're deeply embedded, especially caudally. The contour, depending on the nuchal ligament and the fatty fibrous crest. And so there's a lot of muscle as well as that nuchal ligament. And we're going to see right under the main a, a fatty crest that varies in thickness. Okay, so now looking at the vertebral formula. Note that the wing of the atlas is easily palpable. That's a good landmark. We have in almost all mammals seven cervical vertebra, even in a giraffe. I believe that there's various sloths that have more or less than seven, but in most cases we can depend on seven cervical vertebra. Okay. So then we go into the thoracic vertebra. And the withers is basically the elongated spinous processes of T2 to T9. Also the scapular cartilage and associated muscle kind of helps make up the withers. And the horse, as we see here, there's 18 thoracic vertebra. This is important because this increases the size of our thoracic cavity, allowing for greater space of the heart and lungs, so we can have larger heart and lungs for a better respiratory and cardiovascular capacity. Notice that the American Mustang only has seven thoracic vertebrae, and hence 17 pairs of ribs. Whereas the bovine has 13 as the dog had 13. We move into the lumbar area. In the dog we saw seven. Here we see six lumbar vertebrae in both the horse and the ox. In both the Mustang and some Arabians we may only see five lumbar vertebrae. That accounts for the shorter backs that we see often in Arabians. And then instead of the three sacral vertebrae that are fused, we see five sacral vertebra fused in both the horse and the ox. Okay, let's look at the cervical vertebra now. Really matter, the atlas and the axis. Here we're looking at the dorsal surface. Lateral vertebral foramina, that is the one that is coming right from the vertebral canal. Whenever that's present, we have a spinal nerve passing through it. So here we have the first cervical spinal nerve passing through the lateral vertebral foramina. The alar foramen, which we did not see in the canine, are in the wings. We basically see that the ventral branch of the spinal nerve is going to pass through that. And then the transverse foramina is in the horse and in the dog, but we do not see that in the bovine. The vertebral artery and vein are going to pass through this. In the bovine it does not. Now we're kind of looking at the dorsal cranial view. There's our lateral vertebral foramina. Here's our alar foramina. So the first cervical spinal nerve is going to pass from that lateral vertebral foramina outward. The dorsal branch is going to then go dorsally into the paxial muscles. And then the ventral branch is going to pass then through the alar foramen. Moving back now to the axis, we see the very prominent bends. Also here we have a lateral vertebral foramina, which we did not see in the dog. And so the second cervical spinal nerve is going to then pass through this. 
going through the transverse process is the transverse foramen or the transverse canal and so remember this is where the vertebral artery is passing through and that is true all the way back to C6 here's a radiograph to show us the lateral vertebral foramina of the atlas there's that ventral tubercle you noticed in the notes there's the dens here we see the lateral vertebral foramina of the axis and the dorsal spinous process of the axis. And here we see the transverse process. Okay, going back to the skeleton. Remember that the cervical spinal nerves are going to exit rostral to the vertebra of the same number. Um, but somebody came up with a spinal nerve C8 so then from T1 caudally the spinal nerve is then going to exit caudal to the vertebra of the same number. Remember that the rib is going to articulate on the cranial aspect of the vertebra of the same number. So the first rib is going to articulate with the caudal aspect of C7 as well as the cranial aspect of T1. So we have the caudal and cranial costal fovea. Remember they are named by where they are on the vertebra, not by where they are oriented on the head of the rib. The tubercle of the rib is going to articulate upon the transverse process at the transverse fovea. Okay, here's looking again at some of these thoracic vertebrae. This, I believe, is in the horse. We can see here the caudal vertebral notch and the cranial vertebral notch making up the intervertebral foramina. In some cases, along this thoracic region, we're going to see that caudal uh, vertebral notch kind of closed off, forming a lateral vertebral foramina. Once again, whenever we have a lateral vertebral foramina, the spinal nerve is going to pass through that whereas the vessels are going to still pass through the intervertebral foramina. So once again just like with the costal fovea the notches are named by their orientation on the vertebra. Okay there's that intervertebral foramina. So once again there's a caudal and a cranial costal fovea where the head of the rib articulates and a transverse fovea. Okay, in this section we've got a equine and bovine thoracic region showing us the lateral vertebral foramina. We see more so in the bovine lumbar area the formation of these lateral vertebral foramina. It's interesting because it's not real consistent even on one side of a horse versus the other. We have one specimen that has the lateral vertebral foramina formed on one side but not on the other. I don't know why. A note about the ribs. Not only are there more ribs in the equine, but hope you notice that the bovine ribs are much wider and flatter and they're actually less curved. Also in the bovine we have very prominent transverse processes in the lumbar region. These are more easily palpable. So you see here L6 is a little bit smaller than L5 and kind of tucked in in front of the tuber coxae. Generally, if you palpate the tuber coxae and come cranial, it's going to be L5 that you'll be able to palpate. L1 may also be hard to palpate depending on the posture of the animal. The spinous processes are also palpable in the bovine. And notice between 
L6 in the sacrum, we've got a nice space there, which is the lumbosacral space. Okay, looking at the equine here, notice how the transverse processes between L5 and 6 and L6 and S1, we may have actually synovial joints develop between those. Later they may fuse. I think we have a specimen in the lab where they are fused. Moving back into the sacrum, this particular equine sacrum isn't the best in that we're starting to get fusion of the uh, dorsal spinous processes, but in general they are not fused, whereas in the bovine and in, as in the canine they were fused to form a median sacral crest. Notice the dorsal sacral foramina and the ventral sacral foramina. This is where both the dorsal and ventral branches of the spinal nerves will pass through. Okay, in the adult animal, notice the spinal cord generally ends at about the level of S1. A lumbosacral epidural. It is rare in horses. More commonly, we use this space for a cerebral spinal fluid tap. It is commonly used, however, for C-sections in small ruminants and pigs. It's also used for hind limb surgeries because it immobilizes the limb at this point. If we move the tail, we're going to see that the space between the first and second caudal vertebra may be mobile. This is used for caudal epidural in such cases of obstetric manipulations or prolapse uterus or surgery on the caudal urogenital structures when we don't want to affect the limbs. And sometimes in the bovine we might use the S5 caudal one as well. And that's all I got.